Good evening, everyone. I want to say thank you for being here, especially on a Wednesday night. And we wanted to make sure we did this in person and not just on Zoom. If you need to get a hold of us, westbasin.org. We've got our staff here. We've got our general manager here tonight, as well as uh, you know Amy and other key staff members. And there's a generic email address, info at westbasin.org. Um, but we're delighted to host you tonight. We'll also thank the city for hosting us. Um, as we bring information to the four cities on the hill. And uh, I'll leave you with this. When you think about the weather we just had, right? I mean, the, 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 the heat picked up, you know, the winds picked up, maybe not so much right here locally for us, but um, you know, we've been through what we're calling weather whiplash lately. So we've got extreme drought, extreme precipitation. This winter, they're predicting another El Nino. But at the same time, the Colorado River is very strange. So, you know, we're thinking about the long-term issues that affect all of us. And uh, a big part of that's water, water supply. And then how does that affect uh, our firefighting capabilities? So please think about that as you go through the workshop tonight. So I am going to now hand this over to the Rancho Palos Verde City Manager, Ara Imranian, uh, to welcome you all. And uh, thanks again for hosting us. Well. Thanks. Thank you. Good evening. I, I'm Aura Moranian. I'm Wrench Palace Verde City Manager, and they're thanking us for coming out here. I think we need to say thank you to the West Basin uh, Municipal Water District for, for actually coming to the peninsula and offering this very important workshop. So thank you to you. I want to say thank you to um, LA County Fire Department and Cal Water for being here this evening. This is a very important workshop, and thank you for coming out on a Wednesday. The fact that you're here is very important because you're going to be our messenger um, to the larger community. I, I was hoping we'd have a, every seat filled here. We don't, but this is a good turnout. But you're going to pass information on to your neighbors, and they're going to pass it on to their neighbors, and so on and so on. And by doing that, this message is going to get across. At a very young age, I learned as, as, as um, in the scouts, to be prepared. It was stressed to me. It was part of the scout motto, be prepared. I learned that as an Eagle Scout. And I've come to a point where the better prepared we are, the better we're able to respond to any incident. And we live in a very high fire severity zone, which means we're prone to, to wildfires. But that's not the only emergency that happens. We, we see all sorts of emergencies. There's earthquakes, there's landslides, there's all sorts of things. But today, we're going to focus on, on firescaping and what to do to harden our properties. And this is very important. Uh, like I said, because of the severity zone, we have the Santa Ana winds, the first of this season. We're probably gonna have more. We know the Santa Anas are always associated with wildfires. The Riverside is, is battling a wildfire. I, I've also learned since uh, over the years that, you know, many times you see a wildfire go through and it raises all these homes are burned. And, and then there's one home that didn't get burnt. It, did, it stood. It stood the fire, and people are always like, "Oh, it's the blessed homer." No, it's not the blessed. Well, maybe it is, but but there's more to it. The person who lives at that property hardened their property, and they did things so that when a fire comes through, it, the embers that travel miles get into those attic crawl spaces, and they cause a fire from the inside out, and those structures burn. I, I live in a very high fire severity zone, and I, I got a letter um, about a month and a half ago from my insurance company saying I had to remove all these trees because the trees were too close to the structure. So I spent, I didn't, my gardener did, uh, the last month, poor guy, pulling out all these trees, poor trees that they took years to grow, and now they're all gone. Uh, but it was all to, to pr pr uh, protect my property from a wildfire. So today, you're gonna learn information on how to harden your property from firescaping, but there are other things that you can do, and we, I suggest you go to the city's website to look at all the other tools that we have available to you um, to harden your, your property, not only from landscaping, but other things you can do your, to your structure. Also, I wanna stress today that we have Alert South Bay, which is our emergency, uh, 
notification system, so you can subscribe to it, you, and the information here is on the screen, but we have information in the back. And also, the Peninsula Cities, all four Peninsula Cities launched um, an evacuation program or platform called Know Your Zone, and we can't stress enough how important it is that every property owner uh, go to pvpready.gov and, and find out what zone you live in, because the entire peninsula has been broken down into different zones, and when when you write that down, you'll know um, if you get a notification that says zone certain number, then you know you during that incident you need to evacuate. So anyway, thank you again for being here tonight. I know you're not here to hear me. We're here to learn from our instructors. So thank you very much. And then before we uh, transition to an update from the fire department, I'll ask that Cal Waters water conservation expert come on up, Tammy Myers. You saw her in the back there, and you can go ahead and say a few words. Okay. Good evening, good evening everyone. Um, I'm only going to take a few moments of your time. We have a lot of uh, important information that they're going to be providing to you. But as a community partner, we wanted to make sure that we were present. We're also here to answer any questions that you may have about programs that we have available. As you start to look at firescaping any types of areas of your uh, property, we do have rebates that are available as well and um, plant pallets that are potentially for um, water-wise and fire-wise uh, safety. So, my name is Tammy Myers. I am the conservation coordinator, and um, I did do a presentation, but I will say if you just go to calwater.com, you can go on there and on our conservation page, we have all of our programs. We also have our contact information. So if any of you have any additional questions, um, I'm more than willing to answer them out at our booth. We have some flyers that are also available along with all of the other uh, materials that you guys will be given this evening. Um, so please feel free to stop by and we also have some uh, host nozzles to give you as well. So thank you very much for your time and you guys have a great event. Thank you, Candy. Okay, up next, uh, we'll have Battalion Chief Mike Lewis here to give us an update about uh, what's happening here in PV. Hi everyone, my name is Mike Lewis with the County Fire Department. I work as one of your local duty battalion chiefs. Our office is over at Fire Station 106 on Indian Peak. And we provide oversight from our city of Lamita to Catalina Island. I wanted to give you a little bit of an update and more of a looking forward about our defensible space program within the fire department. And I'll do it as briefly as I can with a little bit of political science because I think it will help all of you understand where we are now and where this is headed if we look a little bit in the past. Now, back when I started in the 1980s, and I know I don't look like that, <laughs> we only had to worry about the first 30 to 50 feet. That has changed, and now we are in some places up to 300 feet away from properties. So the Defensible Space Program as a whole in the fire service has seen an enormous evolution in the last four decades. Your neighbors here on the peninsula, last year, the fire department performed in the neighborhood of about 6,000 inspections. In 2023, that number grew to 22,500 inspections. And that's because a lot of your neighbors in February for the first time became a member of the club. They got the letter. And it's nearly every single property from Pacific Coast Highway all the way to the lighthouse. Those are all of the structures that we're now inspecting. So many of your neighbors are doing this for the first time. There's some of you in this room and some of you by video and some by other means that we're coming to you that have been doing this for a long time. So you have some experience that you can share with your neighbors. But for those of you, this is your first year. I can imagine the uh, concern, where do I begin? How do I get organized? And what does it look like moving forward? You may have heard this for a long time in California, but fire season is, has been year round and it is still year round. So even though we began to provide outreach to you in February, when the, when the letter shows up to remind you that this is your notification, that you need to begin examining your property in preparation for the fire department to show up in June, this now is gonna be a part of your life year round. And for those of you that are starting within this first year, you probably have some experiences that are going to allow you to begin planning for this year round endeavor. If you wait till the last minute, it's going to catch up to you and the fire department 
just because we've had two major fires on this peninsula in the last 50 years. And when I mean major fires, I mean hundreds of acres and the loss of structures, 1973 and 2009. So there's 50 years of fuel growth on this peninsula in various stages. The, gr the grass and light flashy fuels come up every year. We have to manage those routinely and religiously. The thicker fuels, the heavier fuels, our larger brush and trees, uh, those we're gonna have to start taking some accountability for because those will contribute to our risk. The letter is a very important guide for you. It gives you the breakdown of the zones where we start from that zero to five foot range. We go from five feet to 30. We go from 30 up to 100 and then up to 200. Now, if your property line falls in those ranges, then obviously the numbers stop, unless you wanna be generous and help your neighbor out. Mm -hmm. But the most important thing is to start closest to your home and begin to work outward with the guidance that comes in your letter. And there's, some of it might be um, a little challenging to understand, and that's okay. We've tried to simplify the resources that we give you to make it as easy as possible but you do have an outlet with your local fire station, especially when the inspections, or even just prior to the inspections are underway. When you see us out there, that's an opportunity for you to engage with your local firefighters and ask questions, okay? Um, our forestry division, we're blessed to have an enormously talented forestry division in the fire department. And they have become an important resource for all of our homeowners. The simplest way to begin examining how they can help you is through our fire department's website. And just for the, for the benefit of you to either write it down or for the people joining us via video, uh, you can go to the department's website at fire.lacounty.gov. And then inside of our website is a link through Fire Hazard Reduction Program. That's Fire Hazard Reduction Program. And in that drop down menu is a, is a location called Fuel Modification. And that list of resources there is gonna to begin to talk about the things that we can plant and some of the things that might be a little more dangerous. And then we have personnel within the division that can also give you some assistance, okay? So this is new for a lot of us as far as hardening our structures, preparing for fire season, preparing for the other disasters uh, that we could face and uh, your fire department is here to provide you that guidance uh, if you need it. Uh, we ask you to be patient. Uh, we're learning as an organization because a lot of this is even new legislation for us. And we're getting that organized as quickly as we can. We're getting it out to all of you. And if we can't find you the answer when you come see us, we will get the answer and get back to you. Okay. Any general questions that I can take? I think that's all we have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you to all our hosts and guest speakers. Uh, we're gonna transition into the workshop now. So um, I'll bring up to the front, Douglas Kent. He is our workshop um, expert and facilitator this evening. He'll go over the agenda for um, the segment. Um, he's also the author of the firescaping book that you have and is at, available at the back of the room. Um, so welcome, Doug. I will turn it over to you. Thank I you. I will start you off with your outline. Okay, well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for showing up. Uh, it's an honor to be with uh, the people to show up and contribute to the welfare of their community and their neighbors. So thank you, it's an honor. <clears throat> I'll be talking today about structures, creating that fire hardened structure, the first five feet, defensible space, plants, and then a rousing three slide conclusion. So fire is an ever present uh, danger. The captain talked about the fire hazard maps and these are shown right here. And these are the four cities and the whole peninsula is a high fire hazard area. Does anybody remember the Laguna Niguel fire of last year? It was in Orange County. It is, that would be the case study for Palos Verdes Peninsula. You really don't get the Santa Ana winds that Riverside does or Northern California do, but you still have the risk. And that fire, let me just cover that fire really quick. That was a May day. It was in May. Uh, it was 76 degrees, eight mile an hour winds, and there was just a small spark uh, that started in the wild brush and it ran right up the hill. So flames elongated to 30 feet instantly. 
and they were sending out those firebrands and sparks, and those sparks jumped the defensible space and started hitting the structures. Well, some of those structures weren't fire hardened, and some of their eaves or some of their openings on their house weren't protected, and those firebrands actually penetrated the structure and ignited him from the inside out. And the problem with that particular situation was that the houses were so close together that houses burn between 1,000 to 3,000 degrees that it was a domino. When one went, that whole block went. And that's how they lost those 20 houses. It was just a benign, perfectly nice early spring day. And that, I think, speaks to the Palos Verdes Peninsula as you have these great days, but on these really steep slopes, one small spark and these flames elongate and then you get the firebrands. And if you live in a tight community, well, if you go, your neighbor might go. So this hopefully will add some protection um, to you. So first, I'm going to start with um, structures. The very first thing to start. So if you have a limited amount of money or time or attention span, your house is where you want to put your time. Uh, and this is just a great example. This is the Wolseley Fire of uh, 2018 in Malibu. And uh, there is no fire in this canyon. So the sparks are being driven, the, the firebrands are being driven by Santa Ana, uh, Santa Ana winds that are going about 40 miles an hour. They're coming up over the ridge into this little valley and igniting the most flammable object. In that situation, it was uh, Mikey Pearson's neighbors that ignite it. There's no other fire in that entire canyon. So this is why it's so important to start with your house to defend against those firebrands that are getting pushed by those convective winds and those Santa Ana winds. This is the bonfire, the Santa Ana foothills, uh, the Santa Ana mountain foothills. Flame lengths were within five feet of that house. Their carport was completely demolished. So we're talking about 30, flame, 30 foot flames right next to the structure, and the structure just brushed it off. That's why starting with the house is so important. Start with the heart and work out towards the extremities. Always start with your house. Um, when it comes to the peninsula, uh, there's areas of concerns. So ridge top living, outbuildings, and small lots are, we need to tailor our approach to these specific situations. So when it comes to fire hard structures, here's the very first most important thing is check all your openings. You are in a maritime environment, which means that salt air will eat at your attic screens. So any opening on your structure is prone to corrosion in this salty air. And so you need to get your son or your nephew up on the roof and start poking those screens to make sure they're in really good shape. State law requires no less than metal mesh that's 1 16th of an inch. So it's really fine and you really need to go up there and make sure that those openings are secure from those flying embers. Uh, you really wanna make sure your roof is um, class A, fire resistant and clean. Uh, the gutters, I'll show you a picture, but the gutters are really sensitive. If you get a fire started in your gutter, it can go up the rafters, across the beams, or down the post. Your siding, I'll show you some pictures of this, really needs to be fire hardened. And what it is is so when those fire brands hit the structure, they just drop. There's nothing for the fire brand to actually stick to. And it's really common for firebrands to stick around the trim of windows or penetrate through the garage door because garage doors get a little twisty over time and they leave gaps around them. Really common entry points for firebrands. You'd prefer to have double pane windows um, and um, small windows that are facing the high fire hazard area. You really want to create a great degree of access around the entire structure. So when the emergency personnel come here, they can actually navigate your entire property unobstructed. They can move their equipment and their men around your property really rapidly. Nothing but one hour fire resistant rating, wood features, and really important, they want to make sure that your address is visible at the street. 
if somebody's going to take a stand at your house, they're gonna to have to call in where they're at. And that address needs to be a really big beacon to call them in. And then we'll cover this, but all the other stuff, the compost, the storage, tools, all that stuff is pulled off the house and just pushed a little further into the garden. Bob, because of the, because of ridge tops, so I don't know if you know this, but um, for every 10% increase in slope, flame lengths double. So a three foot flame on the flats would be a six foot flame on a 10% slope and it would be a 12%, a 12 foot flame on a 20% slope. And on a 30% slope like this, the flame lengths would be no less than 24 feet. You put a little small wind up against that and now the flames are 30 foot lengths. So it makes your community as beautiful as it is, uh, really risky. Um, you're gonna get some intense heat as that convective heat rushes up this hill. You're gonna get this heat and firebrands and long planes attacking the structures. Um, and the solution is make sure all your openings have screens on, no less than one eighth, I mean one sixteenth metal mesh. Um, there are a lot of screens that are marketed in California. We have three companies and they're listed in the resource section that sell fireproof screens. Um, you want to make sure that the eaves underneath here, that as those firebrands come up and that heat comes up and it gets trapped underneath the eaves, you really want to make sure the eaves are painted. There's no peeling paint. The peeling paint is where those firebrands will stick and attach to the rafters or the underbelly of the roof. Um, you really, this is a really vulnerable place is if you had wood trim around your windows over time, the wood starts twisting and warping and it leaves small gaps. And those small gaps allow those firebrands to attach itself to the structure. And if it's wood, well, that's, uh, that's ignition. And then siding, naturally you want uh, non-flammable siding, stucco would be absolutely ideal. But I have uh, toured the state since uh, mid 1990s, um, going post fire to the state's biggest fires. And I've seen wood structures survive. Wood can survive as long as when the fire branch hit it, they just drop. There's nothing for those fire brands to stick to on the structure. Um, Alley buildings, uh, there's a lot of big properties on the peninsula. And when I was doing my analysis um, two years ago, I saw a lot of examples. This is an ADA unit. Um, and it was just the back side of the property. You can see that um, this is an incredible risk. With, this was to ignite that you could get penetration each of those openings. Uh, you have a um, softwood fence. And this is a freeway for fire. This is how fire moves from property to property is it takes the freeway of the fence and goes to your neighbor. This is really common, especially at Roland, um, Roland Heights, I mean Roland Hills. Um, you can see the gaps around these doors. And so when a firebrand or intense heat comes in, it will just penetrate here. And if they had feed in there, so if they had hay or any kind of uh, highly ignitable material, it's going to ignite from the inside out. And that structure then produces its own firebrands and becomes part of the cause. So this is just what risk looks like. Small properties, holy moly. So the state's largest fires, so this is the campfire, the Tubbs fire, the tunnel fire, and the cedar fire, all devastated small lot communities. And the problem is, is when one house goes, there's not enough distance in between them to stop that fire from traveling. This is the old fire in San Bernardino. 1,003 structures were lost in 2003. And all that vegetation on that side is eucalyptus. Nothing's inflamed. That landscape was not inflamed. A firebrand ignited one house and it moved right down the block. It was just a domino. And this is really, you've seen this, I see this all over the peninsula. If one of these goes, that fire can be just transmitted right down that street. So the most important, the single most important thing you can do is to put a buffer, a, um, a cinder block wall in between your properties to absorb and stop that radiant heat 
from getting on to the market. Single most important thing. And the reason you don't see this in communities is because that's an expensive wall. <laughs> You're dealing with masons and concrete and it's just expense. Um, second most important thing you can do is to create multiple ways off your property. We saw this in the tunnel fire of 1991 in the Oakland Berkeley Hills is people, Californians don't like their neighbors. And, <laughs> and we just hem ourselves in. We don't wanna see anybody. And what you do is you really lock yourself into your property. And during the tunnel fire, the only way these people could flee was to go into the fire. And 25 lives were lost. Nine of those were lost on their property. The rest were lost in cars. Um, and so really talk to your neighbors and create these multiple ways off your property in case something goes so fast, things are moving so quickly that you just cannot flee out the front of the home. Uh, second or third, try to share as much vegetation as possible. I know we don't want to see our neighbors, but it'd be nice to work with them um, on one tree can shade both properties. Uh, we'll talk about plants, but you want the most fire resistant and fire retardant plants possible. Um, if you have a pool, uh, one, I'm gonna say this for the water district, if you have a pool, please put a pool cover on it to slow evaporation, but a pool becomes a really critical resource in any type of emergency, whether it's a fire or earthquake, it becomes a resource that your whole community can tap into and use. Uh, this was a problem in the Wolseley Fire in Malibu is that the residents didn't want the tourists, so they didn't create any off-street parking and they put all their cars on the street, so they took a two-lane highway, a two-lane road, and made it a one-lane road with all their on-street parking and the emergency personnel couldn't get down the street. Um, so if you are in a high-density neighborhood, off-street parking is vital for evacuation and emergency response. And this is just for your information. It, it just covers exactly what I just covered right here. And you can see a lot of those characteristics up there. Um, so this is something that we can all do. And it doesn't require any money. Something that you can actually just go home and do today or get your son to do is get up on the roof and get up underneath your eaves to make sure that those screens are not corroded by that salt air. So check all your openings. And that's the openings um, for the duct from the uh, uh, laundry dryer. Uh, check the openings around your um, garage doors. Check the trim, any kind of opening. Uh, clean all roof and gutters. As I said, you know, if you get a fire right here, it can go um, up the rafters, across the beam, and down the post. And then manage all your seams. See these gaps right here? This is a perfect opportunity for firebrands to attach themselves to this structure and instantly ignite it. So the quick fix here is just take a power washer, knock that paint off, let it dry, take some silicone and silicone that, and then just put any paint on it. And when those firebrands hit that wood, they'll just drop. There's nothing for it to stick to. There's just nothing to ignite. Um, and then, again, really make sure your address is visible. And this is true all year long. If you sprain your ankle or something happens on your property, your address really needs to be visible for the emergency responders. Uh, the first five feet, we have a video, but uh, this is so critical. I'm just going to explain why the first five feet is absolutely correct. The first five feet is so important that the city of Malibu outlawed all woody mulches within the first five feet. Yeah, and I'll, I'll explain why. If you have a two-foot flame out in the open and you have radiant heat going in every direction, you take that two-foot flame and you put it up against a um, vertical surface, that radiant heat has no place to go. And so you get this compression happening and then you get this convective processes, this wind, hot air rises, right? Well, as that hot air rises up against this vertical surface, it takes the flame length with it. So what would be a two foot flame out here next to a vertical surface becomes a five, six or seven foot flame. So here you're not really too much danger, but here you're now talking about flames at the, at the trim along your windows, you're looking at flames up into the eaves. This is why the first five feet is absolutely essential and, and Malibu took those dramatic steps. We have a quick video. Okay. This is so important, we made a video about it. 
Our job is to help you create a property that can survive a firestorm. After you fire harden your structure, the next most important thing to do is manage the five feet around the entire structure. It plays a disproportional role in your home's protection. Here's why, if a fire starts within this first five feet, it can spread in one of three ways. Through direct flame contact, where the flames just radiate out and start touching and igniting things. Or it can spread through conduction, where radiant heat spreads out in every direction and can ignite something. Or worse yet, spread through convection, whereas a column of hot air would rise up against the structure and igniting anything that is remotely flammable on this. Five feet plays a disproportional role in your home's protection. Some of the key characteristics of this five feet are no dead, dying, or diseased vegetation, no litter, no flammable materials like fabrics, and no weeds, no mulches. And if you're gonna use plants within this first five feet, make sure that they're succulent, moist, well watered, and well taken care of like these plants. As you can see, this homeowner is really careful on how they maintain this first five feet. Not only are these plants really well maintained and fire resistant, but there's no mulch, no woody mulch or weeds that would ignite from firebrands or intense heat. These homeowners are taking care of their house. Let's go around the corner and see what else they've done to help their house survive a firestorm. Living in fire country is complicated. Most people store their objects right up against the structure. It could be tools, it could be lumber, recyclables, in this case a potting bench, pool items, barbecues. All these items pose a risk in fire country. It is so essential to make sure that the first five feet does not have flammable, dead, dying, or diseased vegetation or any kind of ignitable litter that would pose a liability to the health of your structure. During a firestorm, firebrands are going to be coming in through this canyon and getting held up in this little cubby, and they'll just circle around looking for something to ignite. It is essential to remove all flammable items from five feet from the home. The homeowners of this house know the risk that these items pose. They already have a strategy for it. During fire weather, they're going to take these benches and put them in the garage. They're going to throw the plastics into the pool. They are very aware of how important this first five feet is in fire country. This has all been brought to you by the West Basin Municipal Water District. If you'd like any more information about their programs, water conservation, fire protection, please visit westbasin.org. Okay, I only have a couple more slides on this first five feet. This is really what fire danger looks like. I don't know if you have a neighbor like this, but this is an unpermitted shade structure. Now, Lake County would have never provided a permit for this. It is made by one by twos, which are actually illegal in high fire hazard areas. It's poorly maintained and it's attached underneath this already existing shade structure. So when a fire ran comes and eventually ignites this, it's going to ignite this and eventually inflame the house and they're only 12 feet away. That unpermitted structure endangers that whole block. That is what danger looks like in fire country. So if you do have a shade structure, we are in a warming world, um, you really want to um, pry it off the structure, make sure there's at least five feet. It would be ideal if you tilted it to allow that convection and that heat and those firebrands and access um, from underneath that structure. So convection actually takes that heat in those firebrands and moves it away from that shade structure. I think you really wanna make sure that this has one hour fire resistant rating and then the most non-flammable plants um, next to it. Just take a look at this picture. So I was doing an assessment for the city of Irvine. This is in the Santa Ana Mountain foothills. Everything in this assessment was getting great reviews. The roof is incredible, double pane windows, non-flammable siding. Their scene management was fantastic. Look at this great access around the property. It was just this one thing. So much of fire protection is actually just basic housekeeping sometimes. It's the small stuff. And having that stuff up against the house is just human nature. 
I can imagine the husband was gonna build something and then one of their children fell on the bike and they just had to put the, the lumber somewhere. They just put it up against the house until they managed some other emergency. But they could have endangered their entire community just by that one pile of lumber. So it's sometimes the smallest things lead to the biggest differences. Uh, defensible space. So if you have a fire hardened structure and 30 feet of defensible space, your chances of survival are better than 90%. You can survive. And that's really the emphasis of this particular presentation today is just creating that fire hardened structure and 30 feet of defensible space. And let's get to that 90%. Our job is to help you create a property that can withstand a firestorm. After you've fire hardened your structure, taking care of the first five feet, your next priority is defensible space. One of the most important things you can do about defensible space is creating pathways for emergency personnel to rapidly move throughout your property. These homeowners have done it. A path that's over four feet wide, non-flammable material, stable, and it's easy to see and navigate. This is essential for living in fire country. The primary goal one or defensible space is to endure and protect. If you can imagine, this canyon is going to be sending up firebrands for days, if not weeks. And this zone in here has to be able to tolerate and endure that firebrand attack and that intense heat. This zone and this property has a lot of winning characteristics. From the landscape features, like the chairs, using non-flammable materials, metals and tiles. Even this plastic, if exposed to intense heat, would just melt. The cushions would be brought in. And when it comes to plant selection in Southern California, we use only the most fire-resistant and water-conserving plants in our landscapes. Succulents are a great example. Big, broad leaves, plenty of moisture, easy to break and open up, you can just see that moisture oozing out. These plants would resist the effects of fire. They would resist firebrands and intense heat. Another neat attribute of this garden is the mulches. They only used in half an inch of mulch, not three or four inches of mulch. They used enough to slow evaporation and to nourish the plants, but not enough to readily ignite during a firebrand attack. They mulch their property perfectly. Another neat characteristic of this garden, of this defensible space, is no large trees planted right up against the structure. So there's no branches brushing up against the structure or overhanging the top of the structure, which means that a fire can't get readily transmitted to the structure. You can see a lot of distance in between the vegetation, the large vegetation, and the structure itself. These homeowners have managed a perfect defensible space. The importance of defensible space cannot be understated. With just 30 feet of protection, you have a 90% chance of survival. These homeowners have gone well beyond just 30 feet, as you should. This has all been brought to you by the West Basin Municipal Water District. If you'd like any more information about their programs, water conservation, fire protection, please visit westbasin.org. So just couple quick additional um, topics when it comes to that first 30 feet. Um, we already covered shade structures, but we'll talk about fencing, which are freeways for fire, and then decks, um, hillside environments have loads of decks. Uh, fencing, Cal Fire has gotten so good at tracking how fires move through a community during a conflagration, and they have found that fences are the 405 of fires. That's how they just travel from one property to the next. And intuitively, you can see why this Ipamea or blue dawn flower has this dead thatch underneath it. Um, we have softwood um, pine or cedar behind it. And once this goes, it just starts traveling right down. Um, yeah, fences are just freeways for fire. So some of the strategies, if you have a fence, is one, try to get really creative with the materials 
and restrict um, the use of um, softwoods. So the pines and the cedars and the, unfortunately, the, the less expensive woods. You really want to restrict the use of them. This is in a high fire hazard severity zone. And these people just opted for um, just metal and then one wood with one hour fire resistant ratings. And that's how they restricted their use of um, flammable materials. But it just really gets creative. And even this plant, this Eugenia Texas privet is considered um, very fire resistant. Uh, I saw this when I was doing my analysis of uh, the peninsula. I, I had never seen so many tree houses in a community <laughs> until I came here. You guys love tree houses. Um, but you're really putting a lot of wood high up, and it's just a big liability. Um, and even this was really common. We have a, an overhanging deck. Anytime you have an overhanging deck, you're going to get the firebrands and the heat getting stuck up underneath it. And you can see that this is not actually um, overly maintained. And it does have a dead bush right next to it. And once this goes, it's easy to go right to the structure. Um, and so the, the, the things you can do for that um, are easy. It's just um, really just make sure that this is, you have a good stain on it. So there's no gap. So when those fire brands hit, there's nothing to attach to. There's nothing to really ignite on this. And the same with this, it just takes a high degree of maintenance or better yet, when the kids get to a certain age, just remove it. Uh, you can take down that relic of their childhood and uh, take it to the beach and burn it. <laughs> um, so just to reiterate on that first 30 feet is maintain that five feet. I cannot stress that enough. Science post-fire analysis has shown time and time again that five feet plays a critical role. Remove the dead, dying, and diseased vegetation. That's the kindling. That's how a fire grows from one fire ran to something greater. You need kindling. You need that one thing to make that fire grow. So we're just constantly sweeping and maintaining our landscapes. And then just watch out for your really flammable features, fences, overhangs, decks, and tree houses. You know, I've given this presentation throughout the whole state and I've never had a treehouse issue until I came here. So that's a neat distinction for you guys. I never even thought I'd have to say that. So plants, everybody loves plants. Um, I, plants, so our first fire in Southern California was the Bel Air fire of 1961. Does anybody around for that one? Yeah, so I think it was 464 homes destroyed. Well, loads of money came roaring into LA County, federal money, state money. And this guy, Kenneth Montgomery, built this big burn chamber and he threw all kinds of plants in there and evaluated every plant. How fast did it ignite? How long did it stay ignited? And how much heat did it produce? And he came up with this list of characteristics for less flammable plants because there's like 2,800 plants available to Southern California gardeners. And to classify all 2,800 as flammable or not is problematic. So I now shop according to plant uh, characteristics. So broadleaf plants, like this coral tree, is less flammable than a conifer is, uh, like this um, Hollywood juniper. So broadleaf is less flammable. Moist and easily bent leaves. If you can take your leaf and bend it without it snapping, it's going to be less flammable as a consequence. So this is what he discovered. Uh, thick leaves are less flammable than thin leaves. This is the rusty leaf um, ficus. Um, this is the plant that, the only plant that survived Lahaina. You know, that one tree. Yeah, so this is how good this is. Thick leaf, look at, you can bend it, doesn't snap really thick, nothing for the firebrand to attach, just wonderful at fire resistance. Low amounts of litter. This is the um, oh, lemon-scented eucalyptus. Lovely smelling tree, but boy, does it drop a load of debris. And this debris is so oil, if you smell this, it's heavenly. But that heavenly means it's high in oils. And so plants with low amounts of litter or less, uh, plants, with sap that looks like water. If you've ever cut um, an oak tree, their sap is really water-like, which means it's really fire-resistant. Whereas if you cut um, this, um, 
a juniper or a pine or any kind of conifer, you get more of that sap, that resin, which is really flammable. Uh, plants without a fragrance. Fragrance just means oils. So a lot of Mediterranean plants have fragrance because it's a water conserving technique. So a lot of our natives have um, heavy fragrances to conserve water, but it just means that they're more flammable as a consequence. Plants with gray or silver leaves, this was a surprise to Mr. Montgomery, um, were really non-flammable, uh, like um, lamb's ear, you know that lamb's ear plant, or dusty miller, mm -hmm. or artemisia, uh, Powell's castle, really non-flammable. Uh, verbascum, and what it is is to get that gray, um, anytime you see a gray plant, um, they're reflecting sunlight into the atmosphere. They're getting too much energy they can't metabolize, so they reflect it back into the atmosphere. And in order to get that gray, they have to pull up minerals from the soil. So it means that the leaf has a high mineral content. There's a lot of rock in it. And so rock is really not very flammable. So go gray, and it looks good at night too. Uh, and then plants without hair. A lot of plants have, are really kind of hairy, like the California sycamore has that hairy underside. And they're a little more ignitable as a consequence. Cowage, Fremontia, all have hairy leaves. So just check to see if you're, you have a hairy leaf. And they just do really well with water, just once a week and non-flammable. When it comes to prioritizing, if I was your designer, I would prioritize water use, limited water use, right around the structure within that first 30 feet. And I would be focused on um, fire retardant plants. As I moved out from the structure, I would deprioritize water. I would be saying, well, this, this zone gets watered once every two weeks. This zone maybe uh, twice a week or once a week. Um, and, I, and the reason being is because the fire retardant plants require a little more water, uh, like the coral tree here, than the fire resistant plants. Fire resistance means that it might ignite, but that it's self extinguishing. Like the California oak, the California live oak might accept a fire, but then once it burns off the dead stuff, it will self extinguish. Same with the lemonade berry and the coffee berry. They're great at self extinguishing. So some of the best fire retardant plants, according to Kenneth Montgomery, was a lily of the Nile. Red bud, the native crape myrtle, the fescue, flax, cesania, grape, liquid amber, philodendron, fotinia, and succulents. This is a good example. This is the um, Santa Barbara daisy, gazania, and the native mimulus right here. And um, really good at fire protection right there. That's a good lawn alternative. Fire resistant, if you really want to save water and you're a little further from the structure, you're going to go a little more native with the artemisia the California lilac, the rock rose, which he said was the absolute best one, um, coast live oak, any of the oaks, cotone aster, lemonade berry, all the mallows, all the perbenas, toyon, yarrow, and yucca. I'll tell you though, uh, um, I'll save that for the next slide. The, when you're working with fire resistant plant materials, there's so many plant lists you can create from. Uh, you can do a bird garden with fire re resistant uh, plant materials. You can do a food garden, lawn alternatives, uh, medicines. You can do natives of the natives. The best plant communities um, for fire protection are chaparral, desert, and woodland understory. Uh, we have a lot of native communities, but these three seem to be the most fire resistant. Succulents, temperates, and tropicals. And this is the... Um, this was a fire in the Santa Ana riverbed of uh, two, 2019, just roared hundreds of acres straight down the riverbed and it hit the citrus and stopped. And that citrus saved a huge housing development on the other side of it. And this was only a 50 acre citrus little farm that actually just was a bulwark against that fire. And um, if you've ever worked with citrus, you know it needs water, a deep water, no more than once a week. It's a subtropical, which is the hardiest of all the tropicals. So it's a wonderful plant to have in fire country. But here's, here's the problem with plant list. Every plant I just recommended, I've seen a pile of ash. Uh, plant, your plants aren't gonna save your structure, it's, it's maintenance. So this is, um, this is the California sycamore, this is the lemonade berry, and this is the California live oak. 
and they are all destroyed because they had no maintenance. Nobody cleaned out the dead stuff. Nobody removed the dead branches. Nobody swept underneath them or took care of the weeds. And so you can recommend plants all you want, but it's really gonna be your labor that saves your plant. It's really not the plant. And I've even seen these plants survive firestorms, rosemary and juniper, because they were so well maintained. So after 30 something years of working in fire country, I know it's maintenance, it's not plant selection. It's, it's your care and attention that's gonna save your property. So any things that all of us can do that don't require much money, and Richards can do this as well, is remove that dead, dying and diseased vegetation. That's the kindling. That's how that fire grows to something greater. Replace vegetation before it becomes an economic liability. Boy. You know, removing a tree is um, the city manager. It's a heartbreak. <laughs> it's a heartbreak. And it, it, we really need that strong parent in, in fire country to be that strong parent and say, okay, it's got to go. Um, and then do not let your plants dry out. And I say this to the Tubbs fire. Do you guys know the Tubbs fire in Santa Rosa? 4,800 structures lost, 22 lives. It roared in 2017, just upended that neighborhood. Well, they, um, they were under mandatory water restrictions. What everybody did is just stopped watering. And so there wasn't a parkway or a medium or a front yard to stop that fire. And that fire was brought right into downtown Santa Rosa. Mm -hmm. And so if we get into mandatory water restrictions, just water once a week or remove that plant. We just can't let that dead material sit on our landscapes if you live in fire country and you guys live in fire country. And here's some great resources for you. So state approved air vents. We have three manufacturers. Um, the closest to us is Yorba Linda and San Clemente, um, but I use San Rafael. Um, fire retardant paints. Um, these are the manufacturers of um, fire resistant paints. Uh, we have nursery centers with experience in fire protection, Armstrong's, Elwood, and South Coast Botanic Gardens, which is lovely. And then we have um, qualified landscape contractors, and you would just go to um, CLCA and look up their qualified landscape. If you have any questions, um, and Gus always encourages me to do this, you could email me. Uh, email me a picture of your neighbor's spot or a, <clears throat> some concern of yours, of your house, and I'll just give you a quick assessment over the time. But, you know, we're a community, and it takes communication uh, to create that community-wide level. And, and so I'm available for communication, and I would love to hear your questions if you want to email me. So. Well, thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for taking your time and spending it with us this evening. You'll find resources, like I mentioned, um, available to you. And yeah, sounds like everyone just needs to be a good neighbor and start with our own backyards. And um, hopefully that will um, yeah, just build community. So thank you for coming this evening. Mm -hmm.